This prolific year of 2021 has now officially come and gone, and with it, another year down the drain of video games that I probably spent a little too much time playing. But another year's worth of games means yet another video where I can tell you guys all about the games that I played this year, because you cuties out there deserve to be in the know about all the things RV rocks. However, before we start, I feel the need to reiterate a pain that I'm sure just about every gamer out there feels, and that is that most of the time, some of my favorite games I played in any given year aren't actually games that came out in that year. I personally find the system of only including games that came out in the year that you're ranking kind of redundant, because that devalues games that either had major DLC or quality of life updates in their post-launch life, and let's be real, we have all missed game launches only to find them for way cheaper or even free. Anyways, with that disclaimer out of the way, here is what I played in this prolific year of 2021. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate released its final three characters this year, and god damn it, I will never stop loving this game. Pyra and Mithra, serving as a safe first party Nintendo pick, really failed to capture my interest as much as the other two characters, but are looking like they're finding their shelf life in the competitive scene to suit them quite nicely. Kazuya, the obvious nostalgic why weren't you in this game sooner pick, positively made my eyes turn to hearts with the pure amount of tech at his disposal, only for those hard eyes to quickly turn to cartoonishly confused swirls when I got my hands on the character for myself. And Sora, the pie in the sky everyone wanted but we all deemed impossible for one reason or another pick, had me absolutely losing my mind at my gaming setup. At the end of the day, he wasn't the character I wanted the most, that would be the Master Chief, but with both of them being from series that I was positively obsessed with in my childhood years, they were ultimately two sides of the same Super Smash Bros coming full circle coin that made me absolutely satisfied with where the game concluded. And while I do miss the idea of new characters coming to this game, I can say with 100% certainty that I am satisfied with its final roster. And Sora is the only character out of these last three that I actually liked enough to get into Elite Smash. So that's pretty cool. Speaking of Sora, this year I finally bucked up and played Kingdom Hearts 3. After tons and tons of people telling me that it was bad, or at the very best, mid, I actually really like this game. Of course, it falls into the standard trappings of Kingdom Hearts, cringy dialogue, a plot that will make no sense if you haven't done your homework, and a heavily disjointed story, but it ends up being filled with just so many good moments. Every bad thing or negative experience that I had in this game is instantly countered in my brain by one of the awesome things that happened. It's truly a game for the fans. One note though, I played this game on critical difficulty, which from my understanding wasn't an option at launch, but it definitely makes things not too easy and far more enjoyable in my opinion. Friday Night Funkin' came out and quickly absorbed me into its colorful world, then swiftly kicked me out when I realized how garbo I am at the game. But between my sister and my girlfriend being way better at the game than I am, I can still backseat and enjoy that colorful world and tasty music. After talking nothing but shit about it last year, I actually found myself really enjoying Minecraft Dungeons on repeat playthroughs. It's one of those games that really opened itself up with DLC and really made me rethink calling it a bad game last year. And speaking of bad games, against all odds, Marvel's Avengers really continued to hold my attention throughout the last year. There were three brand new characters this year, and all aside from one, I have made individual videos talking about their implementation on other places on my channel. But if you don't feel like listening to a man-child drone on about how good the worst game of 2020 is, Hawkeye story good, character boring. Panther character good, story boring. Spider-Man character good, no story. But you didn't come here to listen to my ramblings about just any game. You want to hear about the big boys, the best of the best. What were the best games that I played this year? I start this list off with two games. Both games that I struggle to call good based on their own merits, but manage to top the tree regardless because of what they offer in comparison to their normal series. Five Nights at Freddy's Security Breach, and new Pokemon Snap. If you are familiar with Pokemon or Five Nights at Freddy's, you will know that pretty consistently, visuals are a weak point of their respective series. Pokemon is always lambasted for its bad graphics, uncouth animations, and a general lack of polish over the whole experience. Meanwhile, Five Nights at Freddy's core is made in an engine that is struggling to keep up with creator Scott Cawthon's ambitions, leading to the games always having this sense of ugliness and rigidness with any actual 
visual movement occurring on the screen. Security Breach and New Snap both seem to act as a way to rectify this issue, being two visually exciting experiences that struggle to upkeep themselves in other parts of the gameplay experience. But god damn do they excel at the visual portion. Seeing Freddy and friends actually move and interact with the environment in the Pizzaplex, or all the Pokemon in their quote-unquote natural habitats is just so exciting to a longtime fan of both of these franchises. Neither of them are the best games, but boy do they do the one thing they're good at so right. I had nothing but complaints when I first finished Resident Evil 8 -age. and while I do think that those complaints are still valid, what Resident Evil 8 -age does right, it does so right. While I still have beef with the way the story plays out, the set pieces provided to you in Resident Evil 8 -age are simultaneously breathtakingly beautiful, yet eerily haunting. The game is probably the most graphically impressive game that I have seen in quite some time, and what complaints I did have with the gameplay quickly start to get lost in all the fun that I was having in the game's post-game content. Unlocking new weapons, mercenary modes, repeat playthroughs with different objectives, it was just a good time. Although, to this day, I wish that I could have skipped the segment with the base. Jesus Christ. One of the things that I acquired this year to add to my gaming library was a PlayStation 5. And with a PlayStation 5, they give you access to the PlayStation Plus Collection, a series of the most critically acclaimed games to populate the PS4 lineup. And there was one game that launched with the PS4 that I remember being enamored by, but I never really had the chance to play. That game just so happened to be included in this PlayStation Plus Collection, Infamous Second Son. This game is nothing groundbreaking by any standards, but it has probably the best execution of superpowers in a video game that I have ever played. And as I'm sure many of you fellow nerds out there can relate to me with, Superpowers in video games are fucking awesome. The story and progression systems are pretty by the numbers, but the gameplay, the open world missions slash collectibles, and especially the movement are so top tier that I was genuinely upset when I found out the game only took a couple hours to 100% after the credits rolled. Sony has a lot of franchises that they've more or less forgotten in the past couple years, but if there is one that I hope makes a random return on the PS5, Infamous has to be up there. Although, if not, that Forspoken game looks like it'll do the job for me. Now, this one might be a little weird to include on a list like this, but out of all the games I played this year, Fortnite Battle Royale might be the most important. Time for a little personal story time. My girlfriend, the light of my life, has been going to college across the country from where I am. Long distance is tough, but in the age of gaming, all the more attainable. What started off as more of a shitpost thing for us to do more than anything else, just tearing it up on some Fortnite together, quickly evolved into our signature remote date night material. Ever since Chapter 2 Season 7, we have been separated physically, but we've been 100%ing the Fortnite Battle Pass together. With the gameplay loop so strong and character crossover so shitposty that you always want to try and grind your way to be able to see them. Sasuke Gangnam styling on your corpse only in Fortnite. Plus, Chapter 3 has been adding all sorts of content that agrees with my gamer instincts, so that helps. I'll be honest, I did not expect to like Final Fantasy VII Remake Integrated or Intermission. I'll be honest, I have no idea which one of these terms describes the Yuffie thing, but yeah, the Yuffie expansion for Final Fantasy VII Remake is so goddamn good. I had my fair share of complaints about the base game, namely how it felt really slow and didn't unify gameplay and story appropriately enough for me, but something about Yuffie's story and how she plays just got me so much more invested in her and Sonon than anything about Cloud. Yuffie is such an infectiously positive protagonist, and seeing her take on Shinra was just such a delight, even if that positive attitude wasn't necessarily reflective of the story being told. If Final Fantasy VII Remake Integrate Episode 2 or Chapter 2 or whatever it ends up being called takes another couple years, I hope we can see more of these smaller story expansions to expedite the wave. Maybe about Vincent next time? You know, that nice little handsome vampire boy? Yeah, you know, yeah. Although, to be honest, I'll probably take about anything if it includes more Fort Condor. God of War! Need I say anything more? Yeah, okay, I slept on God of War when it first came out, but for no particular reason. I bought it when I got a PS4, but I just didn't have a reason to keep playing it, and I wasn't particularly hooked on the story. But one day, my sister and I bucked up and decided to give it another shot, and yeah, it was as good as everyone said. Go figure. I found God of War appealing, particularly in its difficulty. I like a good hard game, but if it's overly punishing for the sake of difficulty's sake, it's just not my cup of tea. But god damn! 
damn does God of War handle it perfectly. If you haven't played this one yet, believe the hype. It's not even that long. I plan to go for another repeat playthrough before Ragnarok comes out. It's that good. Spider-Man Miles Morales is a complicated one for me, because on one hand, I acknowledge that it's probably worse than the other Spider-Man game, but on the other, everything about its story, its protagonist, its characters, even the moveset just hit on a much more personal note for me. Personally, I've always preferred the more fledgling, just starting out Spider-Man stories as opposed to the seasoned Spider-Man stories we tend to get more nowadays, and the fact that we got that pseudo-origin story for Miles in the original Spider-Man PS4 means that in this game we can deal with the more angsty bits of a Spider-Man origin story without too many bits of the learning parts. Helping this matter is that Spider-Man's origin story has been done so many different times that I'm glad we get it in a new version with Miles. If Spider-Man PS4 was a cake, Miles Morales would be an ice cream cake. No obnoxious overspewing of buttercream frosting, that much sweeter to the taste, and a lot more digestible to eat in one sitting. This is my favorite Spider-Man game to ever be released, and that is no exaggeration. You knew this one was coming. Honey Pop 2 Double Date takes just about everything that I loved about the first one and amped it up. More girls, more conversations, more twists on that match 3 gameplay formula that I have come to love so much. I have a whole video on this game explaining why I like it so much, but frankly, I feel like I could do it more justice, so expect a remake sometime soon. I mean, come on, it's Honey Pop. If you know what you're getting into, you're probably gonna really like this game. Every year, there was a game that I am surprised got as much press as it did, and this year, that game was It Takes Two. I liked A Way Out, and I was sure that It Takes Two was as good, if not better, than that game. But was it Game of the Year material? I wasn't sure. So I went out of my way to play it before the end of the year, and now I see what everyone was talking about. This very much feels like one of those games that I would go on and on about and say is the best game ever, and everyone would tell me that, yeah, it was good, but I was hyping it up a little too much. Except somehow everyone agrees with me this time. This game's truly that much of a blessing. A cute little story about the labors of love told through a delightfully charming platformer anthropomorphizing common household objects and settings into their own vast worlds with creative theming and sublime character design throughout. So many different gameplay ideas at play in every single world, but they never stay too long to feel like they've worn out their welcome. And astounding replay value due to each character getting their own gimmicks in each world. This is a game that I would never expect anyone to actually give Game of the Year, but it won so many awards, and you know what? It feels good to agree with gaming journalism for once. Sometimes a game speaks to you, and against all odds, this game about a divorcing couple turning into dolls to work out their relationship troubles was the one for me, despite nothing in that game ever being a problem that I've ever had to deal with in any fashion. It Takes Two is easily my game of the year. It's just so cute. Play it with your loved ones. And if you think that my channel is the best one that you've watched this year, then why don't you subscribe to RV Rocks and ring the bell, like this video, and comment with the best games that you played this year. After this video goes up, I am going to be taking a little break, revamping my recording setups and catching up over on TikTok. So if you don't hear it from me anywhere else, thank you all for making 2021 the best year for my channel so far. A lot of the time on the internet, when supporting a creator, you don't really get to feel the fruits of your labor, so for anyone hanging out down here in the small YouTuber depths, know that you are seen. Every view, every comment, like, subscription, I feel the benefits. So once again, thank you. Thank you so much for every small push. I truly feel everything. See ya in 2022.